We are in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. And the title for the sermon is, Gear Up, the Invisible War is On. It was the winter of 1914. German soldiers were living in their dreaded World War I trenches. They were in the midst of the Great War, the war to end all wars. Despite the pain of cold, wind, rain, and inclement weather, despite the barbed wire, landmines, machine guns, and deadly poison gas, the German army began to do something, something special. They de decorated their trench for Christmas with some evenly cut trees with a handful of lit candles. The German troops began what millions in their nations had done for the years on December 24th. Just a couple of hundred feet away in the neighboring trench were French and England. They could hear the singing of Christmas carol silent night. The Allied forces were overcome with joy. Upon hearing the German army singing out Christmas carols, the British and the French also began to sing. At first, there was a friendly competition based on volume, until both sides sang in unison, each in their native tongue. What happened next was unprecedented in the annals of war history. Ignoring the direct orders to find the enemy army and destroy it, both sides ventured out of their trenches and celebrated Christmas together. Standing in no man's land, both sides exchanged handshakes rather than bullets. They gave each other jam, chocolates, other items. At one front, the men engaged in a friendly game of soccer, using their rifles as stand-up goals. The generals were helpless as the soldiers forgot that it was wartime. Beloved, we are in a wartime. There is no friendly truce, no ceasefire. We do not live in peacetime conditions. Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I'm sending you out a sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. John chapter 16 verse 33 says, I have said these things to you, that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. In, John, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 reads, Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The Christian life is nothing less than a warfare against a hideous enemy. And you know the enemy is devil, Satan. When you and I become a Christian, you begin to face opposition from the devil. There's a declaration of war. The moment I, you and I become a Christian, this war is declared. It's a conflict between Satan and God, between truth and lies, between light and darkness, between holiness and unholiness, between heaven and hell. The kingdom of darkness is led by its general, Satan, and the kingdom of light is led by Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. There's no middle ground. There is no neutrality. There's no ceasefire. There's no peace treaty. There's no armistice. There are no rules to the war. There is no Geneva Convention. Beloved, the war is absolutely ruthless. And as believers adopted into his kingdom, into God's kingdom, we are automatically drafted into the Lord's army, and it becomes absolutely crucial for each one of us to know the strategies of our enemy and to be equipped to resist the evil one. You know, beloved, many Christians live a defeated life. 
Why? Because they do not seriously understand or, and are not engaged in the battle to which they are called. Many Christians know very little about spiritual warfare. Many of them find the devil behind every bush and are into exorcism rather than following the spiritual plan for scriptural plan for spiritual warfare. Some Christians think that the opposing football team is the devil. To some, it's a figment of their imagination. I hope you believe in the devil. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 12 reads, Fight the good fight of the faith. The Christian life is a battlefield. And the more you live as a Christian in this world, the more you will find yourself in conflict with the devil. We cannot live our lives assuming there is no spiritual conflict. In this world, you have three great enemies. We read that in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. That's your number one enemy, the world. Goes on to read, the, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's your number two enemy, Satan, the devil. And he's the leader of the alliance. And as it goes on to read, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. There you find the third enemy, the flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The world, the devil and the flesh. They are against God. They are against the things of God. They are diametrically opposed to the things of God. And Paul reveals that this, these are your great enemies, forming a triple alliance against the child of God. And the moment you and I become a Christian, you face opposition from this alliance. The moment you're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, you, my beloved, are in a state of war. Our faith is constantly under attack. We're under siege. Our families are under attack. Our ministries are under attack. Our marriages are under attack. And as a Christian, the devil is like a roaring lion waiting to devour whomever he can. It was Charles Spurgeon who states, Satan never kicks a dead horse. When you and I become a believer... The war is raging upon us. And if we think that once we are converted, we are taken out of the battle, that, my beloved, is not true. When you became a Christian, you were plunged deep into the battle. As an unbeliever, you had no battle because Satan was your friend. But when you became a believer, Satan is your foe. If you are on Jesus' side, Satan is your enemy. Jesus himself said, whoever is not with me is against me. So this morning, if you are a child of God, if you have put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have repented of your sins, if you have turned from darkness to light, I encourage you today to fortify your faith. Gear up. The invisible war is on. Today we'll look at Ephesians 6, as I mentioned, and we'll be looking at verses 10 through 12. And let me give you a road map for our study. The first one is tap into the power of God. It's found in verse 10. Second, put on the armor of God. Verses 11 through 12. Let's look at the first one, first truth there. Tap into the power of God. Paul begins verse 10 with the word finally. Let's stop right there. Finally means as for the rest. It's summing up all that Paul has said so far about the Christian life. 
The Apostle Paul is drawing his letter to an end, and as he does that, he's addressing one last point. One last thing that he wants us to know. One final business that needs to be dealt with. This is the grand finale of the letter. You see, this letter was so important. This, I mean, not the letter, this section in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 onwards, was so important to the Puritan William Gurnall that he wrote three volumes on these verses, about 1,200 pages. I think it was Charles Spurgeon who said, after the Bible, this is the only book that helped him in his spiritual life. The one written by William Gurnall. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preached 52 sermons on these verses. It's two volumes. You see, the Apostle Paul had given us five and a half chapters before he gets into the section. Just to kind of review some of these truths that we have learned in the five and a half chapters, we won't be looking at all of them, but we've seen that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in chapter 1. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to adoption as sons. He redeemed us through his blood. He forgave us our sins. He lavished upon us all wisdom and insight. He sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit. He gave you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. He gave us power, the power that raised Christ from the dead. He made us into one new man. He reconciled us. We are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints. We are members of God's household. I mean, in light of all this, as he has built up five and a half chapters, Paul is reminding us there is one last truth, beloved, that I want you to know. There is this one last truth that I'm trying to, trying to drive through into your hearts. So he begins, verse 10, with the words, Finally, be strong in the Lord. Let me tell you two things about the verb, be strong. First of all, it's an imperative, meaning it's a command. Paul is letting us know that we are to be strong in the Lord. It's not a suggestion. We are commanded to tap into the strength of the Lord obediently. Second, it's in the present tense. We are to do this continually. God's input must be ongoing. Why? Because we are in the midst of a battle that goes far beyond us. It's not a fair fight. Satan is so much more powerful than we are. Looking at a passage this morning from Mark chapter 5 verses 8 through 9. It was a story about the man who had demons in him, and Jesus went up to him and said, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Legion means many, 5,000 to 6,000 in number. There were 5,000 to 6,000 demons living in this one man. You and I cannot deal with that. Even the Pharisees recognized when Jesus was driving out the demons, that that was supernatural. They could not give credit to God because they did not want to accept Jesus as the king of kings. So they said he did this by the power of Beelzebul. Beloved, demons are shrewd and deceptive. And the war cannot be won on our own strength, by our own resources. We are fallible beings. We are finite beings. This is why we need to draw, or rather, if you put it in the present tense, we need to be drawing on the strength that comes from the Lord. And we need this continually. If you are to be victorious in your spiritual lives, you dare not stop relying on God. You need His empowering presence continually in your lives.
This is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verses 13. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He reminds Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And as you see these verses, the only way you and I can live a victorious life is if we draw strength from the Lord Most High. Now, this does not mean that we are passive spectators. It does not mean let go and let God. It does not mean just look to the cross. It does not mean just focus on your justification and do nothing about it. But it means working out your salvation with fear and trembling. The power to win the battle is available to you, but you must appropriate that power. You need to tap into that power. You are not to be passive, but active. This is what Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13 says. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So yes, you need to tap into the power that comes from the Lord. How can you, you and I be strong in the Lord? How can you and I be strong in the Lord? Because Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord. Tap into that power. Let me give you three principles as to how you and I can be strong in the Lord. First, to be strong in the Lord, we need to be first and foremost, be in the Lord. Come back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Reads, finally, be strong in the Lord. Stop right there. We need to be in the Lord. He is the source of our strength. Christ is the spear within which we find our inner strength. You and I cannot understand what it means to be strong in the Lord unless you and I are truly resting in the Lord. Unless and until you and I are having saving faith in Jesus Christ. Unless and until you and I are in union with Christ Jesus, we will not understand what it means to be enabled and empowered by the Lord. So yes, you want to be strong in the Lord, you need to be first and foremost be in the Lord. Second, to be strong in the Lord, we need to know the strength that comes from the Lord. Read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul piles up synonym upon synonym to make his point here. He uses three different Greek words. He uses dynamis. That's the strong, be strong in the Lord. That's the word dynamis. In the strength, that's the word kratos. Of his might, it's the Greek word iskush. Dynamis means working strength. Paul is saying be strong in the Lord there. Kratos means might or strength. It's the power displayed when a muscular man bends an iron bar. It's the power to overcome resistance. It's the power that nothing stands in the way of that power. The next word, ishkush, means inherent power. When you see a muscular man flex his muscles, you know that he has power. He doesn't have to do anything, just flex his muscles and you see those, you can feel the power in those muscles. This is the word that's used there. The indwelling strength of God. And we read this again in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. You see the words used there. Paul uses synonyms there for the same word power. And let me read that for you. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Reads what's the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. According to the working of his great might. That he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Even there he piled synonym upon synonym to reflect the word power. And what is the power that we are talking about? 
The Bible says here in Ephesians 1, 19 and 20, God raised Christ from the dead. As he raised him from the dead, he seated him at the right hand of his father, right hand of the father in the heavenly place. He subjected all things under his feet and he has given him as head over the church. And by virtue of us being in union with Christ Jesus, we as believers possess the same resurrection power. The power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us. And so as Paul is using these different synonyms for power, he's making a point. He's telling you, beloved, the battle is intense. And you need to be strengthened with all the strength you can get. The battle is real, the casualties are real, and you need to be empowered for the battle. And the only way you can be empowered for the battle is to draw your strength from the power that comes from the Lord. Third, To be strong in the Lord, you need to recognize your weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 through 10 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It is only when we humble ourselves, it's only when we recognize that we are weak and, and we see our propensity to sin, that it drives us all the more to the Lord. The weaker we are, the more clearly we see God's grace shining in our lives, upon our lives. Otherwise, we'll be like the Pharisees, self-righteous. Remember John chapter 15, verse 15, it says, I am the vine and you are the, speak to me, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So yes, beloved, we need to tap into the power of the Lord. Verse 10. Let's move on to verses 11 and 12. We need to put on the armor of God. Let me read verses 11 and 12 for you. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic power over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let's look at the phrase, put on the whole armor of God. Do you know that Paul, is, as he's writing this letter, he's sitting in a jail cell. I mean, he's sitting in a cell with Roman, prison, uh, Roman soldiers handcuffed to his hands. And as he's looking at this elite Roman soldiers with, with, the, with the helmet and the shield and the sword, he's reminded him, reminding himself that this is how you need to be equipped for the battle. And he's taking those pieces of armor and he's using that as a teaching point, as an object lesson to communicate to us some very important truths in our spiritual warfare. So he says, we as Christians, we need to put on the full armor of God. Let me tell you something about the verb there. It is an imperative verb. You're commanded. It's not a suggestion. You're commanded to put on the armor. You have a responsibility. It's your duty. You must be intentional. Just like you wake up in the morning and you put on clothes. You put on the armor of God. Now, at the end of the day, you may come home and you may change your clothes. No, you don't take off the armor of God. You put on the armor of God and you keep putting it on. All your life. There are no coffee breaks. You don't take them off. The emphasis here is on the fact that we have put on the whole armor. We, if we do not put on the whole armor of God, we are living disobedient lives. No soldier who expects to go to war, to wage the war and defeat the war enemy would go into the battlefield without the proper gear. He goes into the battlefield wearing the protective armor. 
And as Christians, we are in a battle, and the only way we can win the battle and go into the battle is if we are wearing our protective armor. Beloved, we are not on a cruise liner. We are on a battleship. Now, we may live our lives as if we are on a cruise liner, but that's getting to a point where Satan sees the weak points in your lives and attacks you. Please come back to Ephesians 6, verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor. Do you see that word whole? Complete. You don't have a choice. You don't pick and choose. You don't say, well, I'll put on this armor today and tomorrow I'll put on another armor. He says, put on the whole armor of God. And by the way, he says, put on the whole armor of God. Do you see where the armor comes from? Where the armor belongs is the source of God. The spear is God. God is the one who supplies the armor. He had plenty of Old Testament verses to remind himself as to God going into battle with the armor on. You look at um, Romans chapter 13 verse 12. He says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. He says, put on the armor of light. 2 Corinthians 6, 7, we read, By truthful speech and the power of God, the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left hand. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, we read, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, but having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. As you read through these New Testament verses, you know that you are in a state of war. It's a real war and you ought to be well protected to fight Satan and his forces. So you need to wear the whole armor of God. Each individual piece of the armor is mentioned by the Apostle Paul. And we will look at that next week. But let's come back to verse 11 because I want to show you something here. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Our battle is with the devil. We must not forget that. But before we look into the conflict, I want to park here and I want to talk about the devil. I opened up John MacArthur's biblical doctrine to kind of just get a list of all the things where you find Things spoken about the devil. He first appears in Genesis chapter 3 as a deceiver. In Genesis 3.15, he is cursed and condemned. In Revelation 9, he is known as Abaddon. In Revelation 12, he is the accuser. In Revelation 9, he is the angel of the bottomless pit. In Ezekiel 28, he is the anointed cherub. In Revelation 9, he is the Apollyon. In 2 Corinthians, he's Belial. In Matthew chapter 12, he's Beelzebub. In Matthew chapter 4, he's the devil. In 2 Corinthians, he's called as a god of this world, small g God. In Isaiah 14, he's Lucifer. In John chapter 8, he's the murderer. In Matthew chapter 12, he's the prince of devils. In Ephesians chapter 2, he's the prince of the power of the air. In Matthew chapter 4, he's the tempter. In Matthew chapter 12, he's the unclean spirit. In Matthew 12, he's also known as a strong man. And in Matthew chapter 13, he's known as the wicked one. By the way, he was not created as a devil to begin with. He was created as the most beautiful and most, I mean, the most brilliant and beautiful of all the angels. He was the archangel. Until the day that pride was found in his heart. And we read about that in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. He desired to be worshipped and to be like God. He desired to elevate himself above the throne room of God. He wanted to receive the worship that belonged to God. And as a result, what did he do? He took a third of the angels with him to turn away from God. Consequently, he was judged and he was cast out of heaven to the earth. And then you find Satan makes his first appearance in the pages of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 3, as a serpent. 
He tempts Eve, Adam and Eve. He brings accusation against the character of God. He is a serpent. As our arch enemy, he is, he is opposing Christ. As you read through the New Old Testament and comes into the, come into the New Testament, you find that he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness. He opposes God's people. He opposes believers. He accuses believers. He slanders believers. He opposes God's purposes. He opposes God's word. He opposes God's righteousness. He blasphemes God. He afflicts God's people. Only as God permits that. He dominates and captives sinners. Uh, captivates sinners. He deceives believers. Alters their thinking. He has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever. He wrestles against saints. He tempts us to sin. He inflicts diseases. He opposes prayer. removes the good seed of the gospel. As we read about that in the parable of the sower. He sows tares. He ruins human bodies and souls. He lies. He deceives. And presently he's roaming about in this world. In this earth. Seeking to devour from he can. He's a defeated foe. Why do I say he's defeated for? The Bible says, Greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. So we've seen Satan. We've seen his biography in the word. And we saw his biography through the lens of God's word. That's a study by itself. But let's come back to Ephesians chapter 6 again. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand. You see the word stand there appears in verse 11. Appears in verse 13. And appears again in verse 14. It's a military term. For holding on to a position that is under attack. That means you hold your ground... You stand your ground even when others are fleeing the battle. Colossians chapter 1 verse 29 we read, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. It's a struggle. And Paul states we are to stand against the schemes of the devil. What are the schemes of the devil? The word scheme there in the Greek, and you will hear it in the sound, is methodoia. Method. And so Paul is saying here that the devil has some schemes, deceitful scheming. How does he scheme? He schemes by stealth and deception. As he did in the Garden of Eden, he put doubts and questions into the mind of Eve. He puts doubts and questions into the minds of believers. He allows the preaching of the false gospel. He allows scriptures to be watered down. To be adulterated. To be misrepresented. To be misinterpreted. He allows man to be autonomous and exalted and elevate themselves about God. This is exactly what Satan wanted to achieve. And we can hear in some of the songs that are sung in churches where man is exalted and man is elevated above everyone else. He uses pastors and teachers to preach and teach half-truths. He misquotes scripture. He creates counterfeit worship, a facade of worship. He brings false believers into the churches, deceiving the body of Christ. He causes divisiveness among believers, disunity in the body of Christ. He masquerades as an angel of light. He destroys families. He destroys marriages. He destroys churches. He promotes sexual immorality. He promotes licentiousness, even among believers. I was in my office the other day, and a lady came up to us, to the office, and she had a question. Her daughter was living with someone whom she was not married to. And she was attending a local church. 
The mother, as caring as she was and who knew the Lord and loved the Lord, told the daughter to go talk to the pastor and, and, and check with the pastor if what she was doing was right or not. And the girl said, yes, mom, I checked with the pastor. And the pastor said, there are many in the church who live like that. It is okay for you to live with an unmarried person. She was concerned. She asked me, Pastor, is that what you hold on to this church? I said, no. That, my dear, is a sin. He promotes licentiousness among believers. He causes husbands to be unfaithful to their wives. He causes wives to be unfaithful to their husbands. He entices people through worldly enticements, fleshly pleasures and materialism. And we become prey to his schemes, to his method, methodoia. He deceives us. But beloved, as I'm telling you these things, I don't want you to walk away thinking that Satan is more powerful than you. As we said, no, the Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world. Christ is powerful. Satan is not. Christ is all-knowing. Satan is not. Christ is omnipresent. Satan is not. Christ is sovereign. Satan is not. Christ has overcome sin, death, and Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. Christ has conquered. Christ is powerful. Satan is no way equal to God. Is that clear? Paul continues in verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Let's stop at this first phrase, for we do not wrestle. The word wrestle means struggle. As I told you, we are not on a cruise liner, we are on a battleship. We are actively engaged in the battle. We are not passive spectators. We are in enemy territory, facing the fiery darts of the evil one. You are in the midst of a battle. You are in a war zone. And I need to remind you this. You may be in your home. You may be sitting in your room. You may be in your workplace. You may be driving on the, in the car. Wherever you are, the fiery darts of the devil is coming. And if you are unguarded, it will strike you. The phrase, for we do not, is in the present tense. The indication is that you're in an ongoing struggle. It's continual. It will continue until you see Christ face to face. And just in case you're thinking it's going to get easier for you as days go by, my beloved, it is not. The more you grow into Christ-likeness, the more you will struggle. And the struggle is not flesh and blood. It is the superhuman forces of darkness. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle. Look at the word wrestle in your Bibles. It's the Greek word pale. The Greeks derived the name palestra, a kind of sport that was held in a huge building that looked like a palace from the outside. Day and night, the, the, the athletes would come there and they would work out and train for their respective sports. There were three kinds of sports that were, they were trained for in that palestra. The boxers, the wrestlers, and the pancreatus. Extremely violent sports. In the boxing event, they were not permitted to box without wearing helmets. It was so dangerous that the boxers died within the ring. The boxers wore gloves ripped with steel and spiked with nails and serrated like a blade and it made deep gashes in the person's body. The, the fight just went on and on until one surrendered or one died. Then there were wrestlers. Wrestlers in those days chose to die in the ring rather than face defeat. It was an ugly sport. One could choke one's opponent in wrestling. You could break fingers, break ribs, gash the face, gouge out the opponent's eyes. 
Now, I don't watch wrestling. I'm not experienced in modern day wrestling, but this was terrible. The third event was Pancreton. This means powerful. In these, in this, the fighters were the fiercest, the toughest, and the most committed. There was no part of the human body that was off limits for them. There were no rules. In fact, the father would pray if the son was in that ring, that the son would die rather than be defeated. Now, beloved, that's the word poly. And Paul uses that word poly to describe wrestle in this context. By using the word poly, Paul was telling the reader that spiritual warfare is a bitter, intense conflict. It's a powerful word for Paul to use it. And he uses it against the demonic forces of darkness. He continues there in verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, meaning our enemy is not human beings, but superhuman, invisible enemy. Isn't that what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5? It reads, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. So our enemy is not flesh and blood, though Satan may use flesh and blood. Paul continues in verse 12. But against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil. Do you see a hierarchy in the rank of evil right there? You have rulers, you have authorities, and you have the cosmic powers. They're powerful. As someone said, don't visualize these as Casper, the friendly ghost. Demons are real. And they are your enemies. They are wicked. They are morally corrupt. Beloved, the abortionists, the corrupt politicians, the corrupt business leaders, the drug peddlers, the adulterers, the thieves, the murderers, they are not the source of the problem. They are just doing the devil's bidding. They are the beck and call of Satan doing what Satan wants them to do. Our struggle is not with flesh and blood, but against the hierarchy of demon spirits within the kingdom of darkness. The rulers are the ones giving instruction, giving orders to the other demons, and they are strategically positioned to bring opposition to the work of God. The authorities of the power carry out the work. They carry out the deeds of terror. They exert power over the minds and hearts of people. The cosmic powers are the world rulers of darkness. They rule over the realm of darkness. They rule over the world system. They are opposed to God. They are anti-God. You see that in pornography and drugs and alcohol and, and everything that's out there. Violence, abortion, euthanasia, stealing. Look at something else here in verse 12. Paul says in verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now listen to this word as I say this, and I'll emphasize this word as I repeat it. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How many times does he use the word against in the same verse? There's a reason why he's doing us. He's emphasizing something to us. He's saying that this is how the nature of the conflict is. This is the opposition he faced. Beloved, as you advance to be a witness for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you will face opposition. We have seen the command to tap into the power in verse 10. We have seen the command to put on the armor of God in verses 11 and 12. Next week, we'll see the command to stand our ground in verse 13. And we look at the pieces of the armor of God. Beloved, in, 
In closing, let me ask you something. Are you tapping into God's power? How do you do this? It's, it's, it begins with a simple process. Have you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. The question is, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him as a king of kings, a lord of lords? You see, the demons knew God, but they did not know God. They were disobedient to God. They did not have a heart transformed to obey God's word. You and I will not be able to obey God's word unless and until we are regenerated. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I'll give them a new heart. I'll take away the stony heart. And I'll put a heart of flesh within you. And I'll give you a new and living spirit, having taken away the dead spirit. Only God can do that. How do you get a new heart? How do you get a new spirit? Cry out to God for mercy. Cry out to God. He will save you. He will regenerate you. He will give you the gift of faith. He will transform you. He will give you a new heart. He will give you a living spirit. And with that, you will be able to love God. You will be able to put on the armor of God. And you'll be able to fight the flesh, flight, fight the devil, fight the world. You no longer find joy in the things of the world. You will no longer follow the course of this world. You will no longer desire the things of the world. You won't be like a dump truck going down a slope with no brakes on because that's what you love to do in your unsaved state. The flesh told you to do things, you did it. The flesh said, commit sexual immorality, you did it. The flesh said, do this anti-God thing, you did it. The flesh said, curse God, you did it. You did everything contrary to what God wanted you to live your lives because you had no power. You did not have a transformed heart. But as you cry out to God, God will give you a heart and a spirit that will allow you to obey God. Does that mean that you will never sin? No, on this side of eternity, you and I will sin. The Bible says until we see Christ face to face, until then it's going to be a challenge. But then you won't engage in sin as if it's a passion of your life. You will fight sin with a passion. You will fight the enemy with a passion. You'll fight the course of this world with a passion. And that comes from knowing God. Are you in God? Are you in Christ? Are you in union with Christ Jesus? And if you are in Christ, I I want you to, I want to come alongside you and and exhort you. Put on the armor of God. That's the only way you can stand against the schemes of the devil. And if you don't follow Jesus, you are on the losing side. But if you follow Jesus, you have already won the battle. The battle is yours in Christ Jesus. Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for the opportunity you've given us, Lord, to study your word. And Lord, I know, Father, that this is a continual process. We don't stop here. This is not the Lord's hour, this is the Lord's day. And so even as we go back home, as we fellowship with loved ones, as we rest, that we would rest in you, we would rest in your word, that we would open the word and continue to seek your word, continue to study your word, and live out a life for your glory and for your honor by the power that you give us by putting on the whole armor of God. So help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.